Uh, thank you. God bless you. Well, I want you to know what a tremendous pastor you have. And he is known throughout Christendom. And yes, thank God for Pastor Mike McClure. You know, it reminds me of the, um, uh, they're casting a devil out of somebody in the seven sons of Sceva and the, the demon possessed person jumps up and says, Paul, I know, Jesus, I know, and Paul, I know, but who are you? And it's like, gee, to have the, the, the devil know who you are. And, uh, and so it's uh, Jesus, I know, Paul, I know, and Pastor Mike McClure, I know. <laughs> I mean, he is known throughout the spiritual world as well as the physical world. You know, I was um, reading where Jesus asked the disciples, who do men say that I am? And they say, well, some say that you're John the Baptist, and some say you're Elijah, and some say you're Jeremiah. And then, of course, Peter says, well, you're the Christ. But I thought, okay, let's look at this. Who was John the Baptist? Well, he stood up to Herod. Who was Elijah? He stood up to King Ahab. Who was Jeremiah? He stood up to the wicked King Zedekiah. In other words, Jesus had a tough side to him. Now, to the prideful, he was tough as nails. To the humble, he was as loving as can be. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And, you know, Peter was with a group around a fire. And they look at him and they say, you are with Jesus. And you can just picture Peter looking around and everybody's eyeing him. And he realizes he's about to get kicked out of the group. There's a, there's a fear of being kicked out of a group. And, uh, and Peter said, I never met the guy. <gasps> it's like, that's it, Peter. You, you were with him three years and you cave that fast? It's a real fear. It is a real powerful fear of being kicked out of a group. But then after the resurrection, Peter's filled with the Holy Spirit. And the Sanhedrin said, we told you never to speak in his name again. And Peter said, it's better to obey God rather than men. Amen. Suddenly, Peter doesn't care about what the group says about him. He only cares about what God says about him. You know, I was thinking maybe one of the evidences of being filled with the Holy Spirit is having the courage to stand up to corrupt government leaders. Well, I'm going to get into my presentation, and um, I have a, uh, I spent a couple years researching every single century of recorded human history to find out what the most common form of government is. And writing was invented around three or 4,000 BC, Sumerian cuneiform on clay tablets in the Mesopotamian Valley. Today, that's Iraq, take a stick, poke it in clay. That's the beginning of writing around 3300 BC. Uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics were invented around 3000 BC. Chinese characters invented around 2600 BC. And so here's Neil deGrasse Tyson, an astrophysicist in his Cosmos TV series. He's standing in the desert and says, it was here around 5,000 years ago between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers that we learned how to write. So Tigris and Euphrates, that's Iraq. But here he is, a secular scientist saying, it was here around 5,000, so we're around 2080, that would be around 3,000 BC, that we as humans learned how to write. And so Franklin Roosevelt said, 5,000 years of recorded history have proven that mankind has always believed in God in spite of the many abortive attempts to exile God. So he's using the number of 5,000 years of recorded history. Richard Overy wrote the Times Complete History of the World. He said, no date appears before the start of human civilizations around 5,500 years ago in the beginning of a written or pictorial history. And so if we round that out to 6,000, because that number is used by some others, um, 6,000 years of recorded history, it's not that long. It's only 60 people living 100 years each back to back. How many of you have met someone who's lived 100 years or close to it? Maybe a grandmother. We're talking 60 grandmothers, and you're all the way back to the beginning of recorded human history. Everything you've ever read about anybody that's been written down has been within that period of time. But now that we have 6,000 years of records, let's look at them. What do they show? The most common form of government is a king, right? You have the first record is Nimrod Tower of Babel. The plains of Shinar, which is Iraq, and... Um, uh, Josephus, the Jewish commentator, said Nimrod wanted to build a tower so high that if, if God destroyed the world again with a flood, he could survive on top. So it had this defiant attitude toward God. And Nimrod made everybody bake bricks and bring them or he would kill them. And so he was oppressive over man. So defiant against God, oppressive over man. God comes down, confuses the languages, the people scatter. But it's almost like every generation since has tried to rebuild the Tower of Babel. And every time it comes around, it's a little bit worse because with military advancements, kings can kill more people. 
So instead of Cain killing Abel with a rock, they can kill with a bronze weapon or an iron weapon or a phalanx spear, scimitar, sword, gunpowder. The weapon improves, but it's that same fallen nature of Cain killing Abel. And with technological advancements, kings can track more people. Right? Instead of the abacus and the rods and the beads, and they can, and they can count. And so um, if you ever studied geometry, there's something called the golden ratio, or phi, P-H-I, or the Fibonacci sequence, but it's a rate of geometric expansion that you observe in seashells and tornadoes and in hurricanes and in galaxies. And it gets applied to other areas of academia, uh, like investments. When Bitcoin was first taken off, they, oh, it's going to grow at this rate, you know. And I thought, well, has anybody ever studied history to see if the kingdoms of the world sort of expand at this rate. And so that was what my project was. I wrote in a book called Change to Chains. And, and so you have Nimrod Tower of Babel. And then 2500 BC, you have um, Gilgamesh, king of Uruk, or Iraq. And he um, is the first one to build the wall around a city. Somebody had to invent that. And he goes, so the oldest story ever written in any language is the Epic of Gilgamesh, about a thousand years before Moses. And he writes in this story about going on a journey to meet an old guy who survived a global flood. And this old guy had made a boat, covered it with tar and pitch, filled it full of animals after the flood, landed on a mountain, repopulated the world. It's the story of Noah, written a thousand years before Moses. Matter of fact, over a hundred ancient civilizations have flood stories in their ancient past. And, uh, but then 2250 BC, Sargon of Acadia, has conquered a bunch of walled cities, considered the first empire. And then you have 2,000 years of Egyptian pharaohs, and they control the cattle and the land. And then you have 5,000 years of Chinese emperors. And then you have Assyria, 700 BC, biggest empire in the world. Nineveh is the capital, and Syria, Assyria took the 10 northern tribes of Israel captive. And then Assyria is conquered by Babylon, which is conquered by Persia. And then Cyrus of Persia has the biggest empire that the planet had ever seen up to this point. He's the one who lets the Jews go back and rebuild the temple. But Persia is conquered by Alexander the Great, about 330 or so BC. And he's got the biggest empire the world had seen to this point. But he stopped from going into India. And then India has Chandra, Gupta, and the Mara Empire. And it's the biggest empire. They control a quarter of the world's population. And then 25 BC, Augustus Caesar has the biggest empire. He even wanted to have a worldwide tracking system. It was called the census. That was like new technology. If he could have 5G and cell phones and cameras, he would have tracked people that way. Uh, and then you have that Ascomite empire in Africa. And then 450 AD, Attila the Hun has the biggest empire that the planet had seen to this point. Army of a half a million men wiping out cities across Europe. And then you have the Byzantine Empire. And then you have Islam comes along in the 7th century, conquers from the Persian Gulf all the way to the Atlantic Ocean. It's the biggest empire. But they're stopped from going into Europe by Charles Martel. And his grand, in 732 AD, his grandson is Charlemagne. And he's crowned Holy Roman Emperor in 800 AD. He's got the biggest empire. And then the Vikings come along, year 1000. Boats with low keels go up every river in Europe and Russia. They've got the biggest empire the world had seen to this point. And then Genghis Khan in the 1200s conquers from Korea to Hungary to Russia, kills 30 million people. He's got the biggest empire that planet Earth had ever seen to this point. His grandson's Kublai Khan that runs China. And then Tamerlane in the 1700s kills another, uh, or the, excuse me, in the 1300s, he kills about 17 million people. And then Ivan the Terrible of Russia in the 1400s. And uh, then this hemisphere, you have uh, Aztec uh, Empire with Montezuma, and he controls the whole thing. And in Peru, you have uh, the Inca Empire with Atahualpa, and everybody's a slave employee of the state. And then the 1500s, the King of Spain, has the biggest empire that planet Earth had ever seen to this point. The Philippines are named after his son, King Philip of Spain. And then the 1600s, France has the biggest empire. Louis XIV, the Sun King. And then in the 1700s, 1800s, Britain has the largest empire that planet Earth had ever seen. The King of England was a globalist. He was a one world government guy. India, Australia, New Zealand, Hong Kong, British Guyana, Canada, Barbados, Bermuda, Jamaica, 13 million square miles, a half a billion people. 
And America's founders decided they didn't like this globalist king telling us what to do. And so they broke away and flipped it and made the people the king. So I'll tell you about that. But anybody that can do plotting sees that this is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. At some point, it's going to max out on a global level. And Jesus says, wheat and tares grow together till the harvest. And uh, if any of these kings hadn't have died, any one of them would have been happy to keep killing and conquering. So in that sense, death was a blessing. You get rid of the, these guys and the devil has to start from scratch again. <laughs> and um, now why does this keep repeating itself? Because it's in each of our own fallen, selfish human nature. And you have Cain killing Abel and one king taking a kingdom from another king. So you, uh, St. Augustine called it libido dominandi, the lust to dominate. And when Adam and Eve sinned, it got into each of our DNA. So you put some babies in a playpen, one takes the rattle from the others. You put some kids on a playground, one's the bully hogging the ball. You put some junior high girls in a clique, one of them is the diva. <laughs> you put some natives in the woods, one of them is an Indian chief. You put them in an inner city, one of them is a gang leader. And all a king is, is a glorified gang leader, right? It's a hierarchical system. If you are friends with the king, you are more equal. If you are not friends with the king, you are less equal. And if you're an enemy of the king, you're dead. It's called treason. Or you're a slave. People say, I thought slavery started in 1619. <laughs> no, wherever you had the first king on top, you had slaves on the bottom. And so this keeps repeating itself wherever you have humans. This is the default setting for human government. And um, now what if you were the king? That'd be pretty neat. And then let's say you have a sister, you love her, she gets married, has a kid, now the kid's a teenager. He's hanging around the wrong friends, drinking, partying, and he's hit someone with the car and kills him. And now he's facing manslaughter charges, prison time, and your sister comes begging to you and says, you're not gonna let my little Johnny get locked away, are you? What are you gonna say to your own sister? Well, I'll let little Johnny off the hook, but don't let it happen again. Guess what? As soon as you say that, you are the corrupt dictator. You just set ripples through your kingdom that if somebody's family or friends with the king, they get special treatment. If they're not, they don't get that special treatment. And if someone wants to point out your favoritism, you're going to be embarrassed and want to shut them up. It just happens. Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And so um, it's just like a pull of a magnet, like a law of gravity. The lesser mass is attracted to the greater mass, and it keeps getting bigger and bigger. And... Uh, I love the movie Lord of the Rings. How many saw that? Right? There's a, uh, this little Frodo, and um, there's a Gandalf, and he says, always remember, Frodo, the ring is trying to get back to its master. It wants to be found. Power wants to concentrate. And then the movie goes on where the little Frodo offers the ring to Gandalf. And uh, Gandalf says, don't tempt me, Frodo. I dare not take it, not even to keep it safe. And they do the special effects, and... Understand, Frodo, I would use this ring from a desire to do good, but through me it would wield the power too great and terrible to imagine. What's he talking about? Every now and then you get a good king, and he wants to concentrate power so he can do good more efficiently. But he doesn't live forever, and at some point he dies, and all that concentrated power gets passed on to some son or grandson who's a lousy ruler but likes the position, and he gets oppressive. And so you got the bad kings concentrating power because they're selfish, and the good kings concentrating power because they want to do good more efficiently, but they don't live forever, and they pass it on to some kids. It's bad. What's the Bible example? Joseph in Egypt concentrated power into the hands of the Pharaoh. And what did that particular Pharaoh do with the power? Well, he fed the children of Israel, gave them the best land to Goshen, gave them jobs taking care of his cattle. But then there was a new Pharaoh that did not know Joseph, and he used all the concentrated power to oppress the children of Israel, make them slaves, and even throw their sons in the Nile River. That's the dilemma. We get our guy in, we let him concentrate power, and, uh, but then he turns it over to the other administration, and they use it oppressively. And um, so the devil takes Jesus to a high mountain, shows him what? All the kingdoms of the world. In a moment of time, and the devil said to him, all this authority I will give you, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. And Jesus answered, get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. But that's pretty audacious of the devil, to say all the kingdoms are given to him. When did he get them? When Adam sinned. Adam was in charge of the garden. 
We know that because he named everything. Naming means you have authority over. You name your kids. But the Bible says, to whomever you yield your members' servants to obey, to him you are a servant. The moment Adam obeyed Satan, he was posturing himself as the one taking the orders, and the devil, usurping power, one giving the orders. <laughs> and so um, all the kingdoms of the world are ruled through fear. That's the energy, that's the electricity that goes through him. You do what the guy at the top says, or ultimately he could kill you. And um, Jesus in Luke 22 says the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them but ye shall not be so he that is greatest among you let him be as he that doth serve I am among you as he that serveth so we're talking kingdoms and Jesus is saying what the kingdoms of the world are they're exercising lordship they're all top down but he says my kingdom's different we're talking kingdoms but mine's different it's bottom up you serve you love right and so these kings claimed to be divinely appointed, the divine right of kings. And so this concept that the creator gives all the power to this one guy, the king, and he dispenses it to all these lowly people down below. And um, here's King Louis XIV, the son king of France. He says, I am the state. And then they told him he couldn't do something. He goes, um, it's illegal. He says, well, it's legal because I wish it. It's like, okay, I think I get it. The law is nothing more than the king's wishes, and he just happens to have a really powerful army to make you obey. It's all top down. Here's King James. James Thomas is named after him. He says, kings are God's lieutenants upon earth, sit upon God's throne. The king is the overlord of the whole land, master over every person, having power over the life and death of everyone. Can you begin to see why America's founders wanted to break away from this guy? And so the British Empire, biggest extent, is global. And the kings have subjects who are subjected to the king's will. Democracies and republics have citizens. The word citizen is Greek. It means co-sovereign, co-ruler, co-king. And so it took centuries before America was able to break away from a king and flip it and make the people the king. And James Wilson said, after a period of 6,000 years since creation, the United States exhibit to the world the first instance of a nation assembling voluntarily and deciding that system of government under which they should live. So he's using the number 6,000, like I said, and that something unique happened in America. Here's Daniel Webster. Miracles do not cluster. What has happened once in 6,000 years may not happen again. Hold on to the Constitution, for if the American Constitution should fail, there will be anarchy throughout the world. Why would there be anarchy throughout the world? Because for 6,000 years, people have suffered under the thumbs of pharaohs and Caesars and Kaisers and sultans and czars, and they thought to themselves, gee, if only we could rule ourselves without a king, wouldn't that be wonderful? And in America, we did it, and if we blow it, there's nothing left for humanity to look forward to this side of heaven than what? Chinese dictators, North Korean dictators, Iranian Ayatollah dictators, Russian dictators. It's going to be a gang war on a global scale, and human rights will be crushed. So it's worth hanging on to our country. So let's back up and see how did America come about. I'm going to go through history sort of fast. Uh, sixth century, you have uh, Islam conquers uh, a huge area. Egypt, which used to be Christian. Syria used to be Christian. North Africa used to be Christian. Then they invade Spain. They're stopped at the Battle of Tours. And then the Turks convert to Islam. They conquer into what is today Turkey. All seven churches mentioned in the book of Revelation were wiped out by the Turks. They conquer um, Constantinople, and, the, um, and the, the Europeans send help. It's called the Crusades. Uh, when Constantinople falls, uh, it cuts off the land trade routes to get from Europe to India and China. So China was technologically superior. They had gunpowder and paper, and paper currency was invented in China, and they had a wheelbarrow and a compass, and they had uh, gunpowder. And, and, so, and then India had teas, dyes, and spices. And, and so this, but when the uh, Islamic expansion happened, it cu cut off the land trade routes when Constantinople falls, and that's when Columbus decides to look for a sea route to get to India and China. And so Columbus thought he made it to India, names the people he met Indians, and, um, but the Ottoman Empire continues to grow, and in the 1500s, they're at the gates of Vienna. And the person trying to stop them is the king of Spain. And so the two most powerful kings on the planet in the 1500s is the Muslim Sultan, Suleiman the Magnificent, and the king of Spain, Charles V. And so, in the middle of this, the Reformation starts. Are you still with me? 
1517, Martin Luther starts the Reformation, and he uh, stands trial, and then he translates the Bible into German. 1529, 100,000 Turks surround Vienna. And so the king of Spain has a double dilemma. He has this Protestant Reformation taking place on the inside of Europe, and this Islamic invasion taking place on the outside of Europe. He tries to stop both for decades, can't, and he decides he's going to make a deal with the Protestants. It's called the Peace of Augsburg of 1555. It was a big deal, first treaty ever to recognize Protestants. In this treaty is a little Latin phrase that had a big difference. Cuius regio, ius religio, which means whose is the reign, his is the religion. In other words, look, Protestant king, believe whatever you want. Let's just work together against this Islamic invasion. Well, it stops the invasion, but in the next century, different kings believe different things. And so northern Germany and Sweden are Lutheran. Switzerland, Calvinist, right? Scotland, uh, Presbyterian, what the king believed the kingdom had to believe. And um, then uh, Holland was Dutch Reformed. Greece was Greek Orthodox. Russia was Russian Orthodox. Serbia was Serbian Orthodox. Spain, Portugal, France, Austria, Italy, Poland, State Catholic. And Russia invited the Mennonites over to be a sort of a buffer between Russia and the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and then England had Anglicans. And so it went from all of Western Europe being Catholic to now you got all these different kings believing different things. And if you did not believe the way your king did, you were persecuted and you fled. So suddenly Europe is thrown into this mass migration of people shifting from one country to another simply for conscience sake. So prior to the Islamic invasion, it's all Catholic. After the invasion, it splits up. And those are the people that spilled over and founded colonies in America. And um, so uh, let's look at England. You had Henry VIII, who was originally Catholic. He's married to Catherine of Aragon, the daughter of the King of Spain. Right? Pretty important person. After 18 years, she does not have a son. And so Henry decides to divorce her and marry Anne Boleyn. Well, the Pope won't recognize the divorce. And so Henry decides that um, he's going to make himself his own Pope. Right? He starts the Church of England, puts himself at the top, and then he has the Archbishop of Canterbury, Archbishop of York, and the deaneries and vicars and curates and rectors, but he's at the top. He goes on to have six wives, divorced, beheaded, died, divorced, beheaded, survived. Henry VIII was not a nice guy to be married to. His advisors told him, if you're serious about breaking from Rome, you need to stop using that Latin Bible. Get yourself a, uh, an English Bible. The German princes have Martin Luther's German Bible. That helped them to break away. You get, need to get yourself an English Bible. Henry says, great, get me one. Well, it just so happened a few years earlier, Henry VIII had William Tyndall burnt at the stake for translating the Bible into English. And William Tyndall's last words were, Lord, open the king of England's eyes. And suddenly now the king wants an English Bible. They take Tyndall's work, polish it up, call it the Great Bible. Henry likes it and orders a copy of it put in every church in England. This is the first time the common people of England can read the Bible in their own English language. And Henry dusts his hands and he goes, that's it, we've broken from Rome. We're free to, free to go. But, but something unexpected happened. People began to read it and began to compare what's in this Bible to this king divorcing and beheading his wives and claiming to be the head of Christ's church. And so a group starts that wants to purify the Church of England, and they're nicknamed the Puritans. The king doesn't like them. He doesn't think he needs any purifying. There's another group that said it's beyond hope of purifying. We're going to separate ourselves. And they are called separatists, or we call them pilgrims. And so uh, you had these Calvinists are coming up with an idea of how to have a government without a king. Um, I don't have time to get into it all, but uh, during this time, you have um, the King of Spain controls Holland, and he doesn't like the Protestants, so he sends the Iron Duke of Alba to commit the Spanish Fury. 1572, they kill 10,000 Protestants, leave their bodies in the streets. Now, there's a lot of killing going on, and Protestants are also killing Catholics. It goes back and forth. Um, and then the King of Spain sends his armada to smash the Reformation in England. And then France. 15% of France becomes Protestant, called Huguenots. And the queen is Catherine de' Medici. And uh, 
her, the husband died, so she's ruling in the name of her son. But she decides she's going to have a wedding with her daughter, Margaret, and the main Protestant leader, Henry of Navarre. And the Protestants are like, hey, great, we're going to have a wedding. We're going to, you know, we're going to get past all the problems. And so two days after the wedding, she has them pull chains across the street. And they uh, send soldiers house to house, and they kill 30,000 Protestants. It's called the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. Throw their bodies in the Seine River. And um, so uh, in this French-speaking area of Switzerland, you have a guy named John Calvin. And he's wrestling with Romans 13. It says, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which is God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. And it's like, okay, the authority is, is this king or the queen, and they're killing us. Um, if we're supposed to, what it, what it, if there's a mandate from the government to kill your wife and kids? Are you supposed to say, okay, i got to obey the government mandate. Here's my wife and kids. Kill them. And so John Calvin began to write things. Like, when the king disobeys God, they automatically abdicate their worldly power. He writes this, we are subject to the men who rule over us, but subject only in the Lord. If they command anything against him, let us not pay the least regard to it. In other words, um, Ephesians 6 says children obey your parents. But what if there's a parent that tells the kid to sell themselves into prostitution and kill the neighbor? Is the kid supposed to obey the parent? No, the child obeys the parent as long as the parent's telling him to do something that lines up with God's word. You obey the government as long as the government's telling you to do something that lines up with God's word. Why would God tell you to do something in his word and then tell you to submit to a government that tells you not to do what he just told you to do? Right? And so these Calvinist Puritans began to develop a form of government without a king, and it's called covenant. And they get their ideas from the Bible. But what part of the Bible? That first 400 years out of Egypt before King Saul. Right? It's the book of Judges, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel. Then you got the king, Saul. And, um, and so this is unique. We don't realize how unique the book of Judges is. Because when you read every other century of world history and see it's kings and kings and kings, and then you got this period of 1400 B.C., Israel comes out of Egypt, and for 400 years, no king. And this period is called the Hebrew Republic. It's the first instance in world history where you have millions of people and no king. And the, the Calvinist Puritans are called Christian Hebraists. And they, that's why they taught Hebrew at Yale and Harvard. So King Saul is the divider between England and America. The kings of England look to the Bible for their authority, but they look to the anointed King Saul and on. The Calvinist Puritans looked to the Bible for their authority, but they looked to the pre-King Saul period, the Hebrew Republic, 400 years with no king. And um, so the king of England, he finally has his English Bible. He dusts his hands. We've broken from Rome, and his attitude was, yes, you can read the Bible in your own language, but no, you, you can't believe whatever you want. You've got to believe what I tell you to believe. I'm still the king. And so you do not make up prayers in England, because you could make up one that's wrong. So the government wrote all the prayers down, put them in a book of common prayer. Feel like praying? You just open it to the right page and read the prayer. And if you're caught with a group making up your own prayers, the FBI will kick in the door and drag you away to a hearing room called the Star Chamber. It had stars on the ceiling, sort of a January 6th hearing room type thing. And, um, <laughs> and they'll brand you on the face as a heretic and cut off your ear and make you confess to stuff that you didn't do. And then they pass the uh, Five Mile Act. If you're caught preaching within five miles of a town and you haven't gotten permission of the government, you're a criminal. They'll arrest you, drag you to that star chamber. And then they call these small groups conventicles. Comes from the word covenant. Jesus said, where two or more are gathered in my name, I'm in the midst. And the king didn't like these people gathering together. All right, you could be planning an insurrection, right? And so they later changed the name of it to the Riot Act. So you're having your little Bible study, and the police bust in and pull out a piece of paper and read the Riot Act, which says everyone must immediately leave the building or we're going to arrest you and drag you to that star chamber. It was so serious, it went into our, our vernacular. Read them the Riot Act. And, um, and so somebody that was caught during this was John Bunyan. And he didn't clear this Bible study, and he spent 12 years in that, uh, in that prison, right? Um, and that's when he wrote Pilgrim's Progress. And so these uh, people are being put in the Newgate prison, terrible prison. Uh, and so these different Congregationalists uh, that started this, the separatists, 
that didn't follow the king was um, they started different churches. And one of them was the Baptists. And you have these three guys, John Smith, John Burton, Thomas Hellwise. And um, it's not the John Smith with Pocahontas, a different one. And um, they start the first Baptist church in England. Why is that important? Because branching off of that church is the Pilgrims. Right, here's the book. With fresh light on the Pilgrims Father's Church. And so one of these Baptist founders, John Merton, he dies in the Newgate prison. They didn't feed you in the British prison. You had to have some friend that missed you and bring you food. So he had a friend bring him a bottle of milk. But instead of a cork, it had a wad of paper. And uh, when the guard wasn't around, he unfolded the paper, took a splinter, dipped it in the milk, and he wrote out his pamphlets. The milk dries. It's clear. He folds it up, puts it in the empty bottle, and the friend takes it home, unfolds the, the paper, and holds it above a candle. And the heat of the candle turned the milk brown. And they could see what he wrote. They typeset it. They're printing the pamphlets. And the government's like, how's he getting that out of the prison cell? <laughs> and um, so the early Baptists called it the milk of the word because he's writing it in milk, right? And, uh, and one of the things John Merton wrote was, no man ought to be persecuted for his religion. Another the practices of Christ and his disciples teaches no such thing as compelling men by persecution and afflictions to obey the gospel. And uh, another Baptist founder, Thomas Hellwise, he dies in the Newgate prison. He said, the king is a mortal man and not God. Therefore, he hath no power over the mortal soul of his subjects to make laws and ordinances for them, to set spiritual lords over them. For men's religion to God is betwixt God and themselves. The king shall not answer for it, neither may the king be judged between God and men. In other words, if the government can stand there on the day of judgment and answer for why you said and did something, fine, do whatever the government tells you to do. But if the government's not going to be there on the day of judgment, you are accountable to God for your own conscience. The kings didn't like that. They didn't want you having your own conscience and belief. They want you to obey them. You just follow government mandates. And so uh, you had these uh, pilgrims and Puritans, these separatists. They're fleeing to the Netherlands, and then they flee to America. They're going to go to a king colony called Jamestown, and they get blown off course in a storm. And uh, they try sailing south, but off the coast of Cape Cod, it's really shallow. They almost sink in the sand. Uh, 3,000 ships have sunk off the coast of Cape Cod. It's dangerous. So the captain goes back to Plymouth Rock and says, everyone off the boat. Too dangerous to do any more sailing. And these little pilgrim separatists, they're like, um, we have a question. Who, who's going to be in charge of us? We were going to go to Jamestown and submit to the king's government. And, and you're telling us to get off, and there's no king-appointed person in our little group. Who's going to be in charge? They do something unique. They give themselves the authority to start a government. It's called the Mayflower Compact. And it says what? We, in the presence of God, covenant ourselves into a civil body politic. So you have a church group, 102 of them, in the boat, covenanting themselves, like that co conventicle, they covenant themselves into a civil body politic. Right? You have a church group forming itself into a political group. Now why did they do that? To enact just and equal laws that shall be thought most meet or necessary unto which we promise all due submission. Simple revolutionary. It was a polarity change in the flow of power on planet Earth. Instead of top-down rule by, in the womb of this Mayflower is conceived the child of self-government. And so instead of top-down ruled like a dead pyramid, it's, it's bottom-up. It's like a living tree where every root and every tiny capillary root sucks in nutrients to keep the tree alive. And so the king has this hierarchical form of government called clergy laity. Clergy does all the ministry and the laity is lazy and watches. And your relationship with God is through this structure. And the congregational model is where Jesus says, upon this rock I'll build my church, and the word is ecclesia, or calling out 6,000 citizens of Athens, they'd call them out of their homes to the marketplace. And Jesus says, upon this rock I'll build my ecclesia, ecclesia. And, um, and so it's his body, everybody is a part. So in the congregational model, different than the hierarchical model, the pastor teaches everyone to have their own relationship with God through Jesus Christ who died on the cross to pay for their sins. And then the pastor coaches everyone to become mature Christians. Get in the habit of reading through the Bible yourself. And then praying every day. And then plugging into the body and doing something. Because everything that's alive takes in and gives out. For any muscle to grow, it has to be exercised. For you to grow in your Christian faith, you don't just hear a sermon. You put, you put yourself in a position where there's a need, and then the Holy Spirit uses you to meet the need. 
That's why I hated the COVID response so much, because it was changing church structure, right? Instead of the body meeting and the older women seeing the younger mom, look, she's a little depressed. What's wrong, honey? Oh, we're struggling this and that. When, oh, let me pray for you. The, the older guy seeing the younger guy, hey, let me help you with this. And, and there's ministry taking place with the body just getting together. Because, you know, somebody is filled with the Holy Spirit and they're around somebody with a need and, and the Holy Spirit uses to minister to them. And you think, gee, I'm really smart. I'm saying something I, I didn't realize I was that smart. You're not. It's the Holy Spirit using you to minister to the person, right? But the COVID response was what? Sit there and look at the screen and hear a really good message. Okay, you're taking in, but, but how can you give out? What, are you going to witness to your pillow? <laughs> and so the congregational model is what these pilgrims had. And um, they got their idea from their pastor, John Robinson. And this painting hangs in our U.S. Capitol in Washington, D.C., and so the covenant form of government is you get blessings from God, you voluntarily share them with your neighbor because you're doing it as unto God. There's no king in the picture. It's just God gives the stuff to individuals and then the individuals voluntarily care for their neighbors. And so John Winthrop, a, the, one of these Puritans, the love among Christians is a real thing, not imaginary, necessary to the being of the body of Christ. We are a company professing ourselves fellow members of Christ. We ought to account ourselves knit together by this bond of love. We must make one another's condition our own. Rejoice together, mourn together, labor, suffer together. We shall find that the God of Israel is among us. So you've been in a Bible study and you pray for each other, but this is the next step. You pray for each other and you covenant together with each other. I'm there for you, right, for the rest of my life. And, and so these, this covenant form of government is what these congregationalists had that they turned into the form of government that they used for the colonies in America. And um, anyway, king didn't like that. And so the king said, I will make them conform themselves or I'll harry them out of the land. And so you have this great Puritan migration, 20,000 flooding into New England. And you have this unique situation where you have pastors and their churches founding cities. And so you have a pastor, John Lothrop, and his church founded Barnstable, Massachusetts. And a pastor, Roger Williams, and his church founded Providence, Rhode Island, and the first Baptist church in America. A John Wheelwright and his church founded Exeter, New Hampshire, and a Reverend Thomas Hooker and his church founded Hartford, Connecticut. This is unique on planet Earth where pastors and their churches are founding cities. And um, so let's look at uh, Thomas Hooker and his church found Hartford. When it, after they get there, the church members come to the pastor and say, can you preach a sermon on how we're supposed to set up our government? And so he gives a sermon in 1638 titled, The Foundation of Authority is Laid in the Free Consent of the People. This is reflected in our declaration, government from the consent of the governed. And this is different from Europe because the kings of Europe do not ask the people for their consent. And then his sermon says the privilege of election belongs to the people. This is reflected in our constitution, we the people. And um, so Thomas Hooker, Calvin Coolidge, Thomas Hooker of Connecticut as early as 1638 said in a sermon, the foundation of authority is laid in the free consent of the people. The choice of public magistrates belongs unto the people by God's own allowance. This doctrine found wide acceptance among the nonconformist clergy who later made up the Congregational Church. And his sermon is written down. It becomes the Constitution of Connecticut that they used from 1639 up until 1818. They're using the pastor's sermon as the Constitution. And so um, that's why they call Connecticut the Constitution State. Here's a plaque in England. Thomas Hooker, founder of the state of Connecticut, father of American democracy. Another plaque, Thomas Hooker, Puritan clergyman, reputed father of American democracy. A statue of Thomas Hooker holding a Bible on the Capitol grounds in Hartford. At the base of the statue, it says, leading his people through the wilderness. On this side, he preached the sermon, which inspired the fundamental orders. It was the first written constitution that created a government. Another plaque, it says, Thomas Hooker, a peerless leader of New England thought in life in both church and state. And then here's another plaque. It says, Thomas Hooker, a leader, a preacher, a statesman who based all civil authority on the free consent of the people. This was a big deal. 6,000 years of world history, the people don't have any consent. It's all top-down, kings ruling through fear. Here in America, you have these pastors with their covenant form of government, making it their community form of government, and you get to give your consent. And another plaque, it says, here... Um, on the site, Thomas Hooker preached his famous sermon, the foundation of authority is laid in the free consent of the people, and then representatives of the people adopt his sermon as the fundamental orders. What do they say? The people can join ourselves to be as one public state or commonwealth, right? So you have the people, which is the church members, forming itself into a public state, similar to the Mayflower Compact. We covenant ourselves into a civil body politic. 
Now, why did they do that? To preserve the liberty and purity of the gospel of our Lord Jesus, which we now profess. They picked the form of government that would best preserve the preaching of the gospel. Here's another plaque, lots of plaques. This one says, Thomas Hooker's congregation established the form of government upon which the present Constitution of the United States is modeled. Do you grasp the significance of this? Church government, everybody's involved, and these little pilgrims land on the shore, and they say everybody's involved in our government government. So they had, uh, in New England, instead of separation of church and state, it was the pastors and their churches that created the state. How could you say pastor don't get involved in politics when it's the pastor's sermon that's their constitution? How could you say church members don't get involved in politics when all there was in Hartford was the church members? There were like no non-church members to be lazy and let them run things. And so the word politics is Greek, comes from the word polis, which means city, like Indianapolis. So politics is simply the business of the city. And all there was in the city of Hartford was the church. They had to be involved. They had one building called the Meeting House. That's where the pastor would teach the Bible, and that's where they would gather together and do their city business. The word synagogue means Meeting House. That's where the rabbis would teach the law, and that's where they would gather together and do their city business. I mean, why build a separate building just to talk about a different topic? And so when the revolution starts, the British send over a military governor, Thomas Gage, and he outlaws meeting houses. We don't need the people meeting and giving their consent to stuff. You just follow government mandates. Simple, top down. You're just a robot. You're a zombie. The government mandates it. You just blindly, we don't you having a conscience. You just obey. And so Calvin Coolidge said the principles which went into the Declaration of Independence are found in the sermons of the early colonial clergy. In order that they might have freedom to express these thoughts and opportunities to put them into action, whole congregations with their pastors migrated to the colonies. And so the pastors had this concept that the kingdom of God cannot be forced by the government from the top down. They fled from Europe where kings were burning people at the stake. They saw in the scriptures that Jesus himself never forced anybody to follow him. They said, if Jesus can't force anybody to believe, we can't. And they thought, well, if we can't force this from the top down, how's that going to happen? They thought if the majority of the people held godly values and elected representatives with those values, then laws would be passed reflecting those values. And the values of the kingdom would come voluntarily percolating from the bottom up, not forcibly shoved from the top down. So this is what happened in America. Instead of divine right of kings, creator, king, people, the creator gives all his rights to each one of us and we're all equal. And we choose from amongst ourselves who's going to fix the potholes in the road and who's going to teach the kids, right? And so in America, the people are the king. The politicians are the servants. And um, anyway, time got away from me. I don't know where it went. So these pastors looked to the Bible and they looked to ancient Israel as the first model of, of how to have a government without a king. There was even New Hampshire ratifying convention. Harvard President Samuel Langdon gives an address to the Republic of the Israelites, an example to the American states. And they vote, they pass it, and, the, and instead of the 12 tribes of Israel, we may substitute the 13 states of the American Union. And so uh, what was ancient Israel? So when they come out of Egypt around 1400 BC, uh, there's no king. It's the beginning of the concept of equality. The law says everyone, male and female, is made in the image of the creator. And this creator is not a respecter of persons. Ancient Israel was the first instance of, there's no royal family to butter up next to. They had tolerance. They're worshiping the one true God. They never felt compelled to force anybody. And uh, ancient Israel was the first place with private land ownership. Wherever there's a king, you never really own the land. And, but in Israel, the land was permanently titled to each family. If you own land, you can accumulate stuff. The Bible called that being blessed. And you can give away some of your stuff. The Bible called that charity. And uh, in the ancient Israel, the children were taught the law. And then God chose Abraham because he taught his children. The battle today is who gets to teach the children. And since everybody in Israel was taught the law, they, they had no police. Everybody was taught the law. Everybody helped enforce the law. Sort of like today, somebody cuts you off. You take it upon yourself to honk the horn. Or maybe a mom watching some neighborhood kids. She has no problem correcting somebody else's kid. In Israel, everybody's correcting everybody. It's a self-policing system. Israel had no standing army. You have a king, he has an army. In Israel, every man was in the militia and armed with a sword upon their thigh and ready at a moment's notice to defend their wife and children and community. Israel had no prisons. Remember Egypt? Joseph was in prison. In Israel, when a crime was committed, you got the accused, the elders, and you immediately had the trial. There was a city of refuge you could run away to to await a trial. Israel had a bureaucracy-free welfare system. Instead of Egypt, where the government collects everything and doles it out in exchange for your land, in Israel, when someone harvested their field, they left the gleanings, the corners, for the poor people to pick through, like Ruth. So the poor were taken care of in a decentralized manner, and Israel got to choose their own leaders. 
Moses spake unto the children of Israel, How can I myself alone bear your burden? Take you, wise men, and understanding, and known among your tribes, and I'll make them rulers over you. And so anybody could be raised up in the leadership. Gideon, here's Deborah, a woman, becomes a national leader. Not because she's related to royalty. She just knows the law. She's honest. The reputation is spread. She, she sits under a tree. People make their way all the way across the country to hear, have her hear the case. Where else in the world at this time could a woman become a national leader who's not related to royalty, who doesn't like have an army to force people? Israel, the bottom-up form of government. And um, anyway, I, I, the time's got it. Israel was the first nation that could read. Only 1% of Egypt could read. And so in uh, the... We had a little of that in America and prior to the Civil War. Uh, Frederick Douglass was a slave on a plantation. And the, uh, in some of the Democrat South states, they made it a crime to teach slaves to read. And so uh, their, the man walks in the room, yells, says, don't you dare teach slaves to read. Frederick Douglass said that was the first sermon that convinced him that he wanted to learn how to read. And so if you want to control the population, you want to keep them ignorant. And so when Moses comes down the mountain, he doesn't just have the law. He has a law in a 22-character alphabet, not 3,000 hieroglyphs. No, so easy to learn. Kids can learn. So ancient Israel is the first literate nation on planet Earth. Where everybody could read. And, um, and then finally, what motivates you to follow the law? All government is somewhere on this line. Total government, kings who rule through fear. No government would be anarchy unless everybody's taught the law. I was thinking of a way of explaining it. Imagine if everybody downloads a behavioral app on their iPhone. Instead of a GPS telling you where to turn, imagine, a behavior, and it's monitoring your blood pressure, your voice volume, somebody's close in the vicinity, and it sees you're about to lose your temper, and it sends you an alert. Zzz, zzz, don't lose your temper. <laughs> and then it's monitoring your bank account. It's a little low, and then it sees you're in a store, and nobody's in the vicinity, runs this algorithm. You're being tempted to steal. Zzz, 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 don't steal. And so imagine in Israel, everybody, so in Israel, the law is like a behavior, and the Levite priests are the computer geeks that help you to download the app. And, but the, the big question is, why would you follow it? What would motivate you to follow an internal moral? Israel had the key ingredient. There's a God who's watching everyone. He wants you to be fair. He's going to hold you accountable in the future. You're about to steal. Nobody's around. And then you think, God's watching me. He wants me to be fair. He's going to hold me accountable in the future. Maybe I should hesitate stealing. Create something in your head called a conscience. If everybody in the country believes this, you can maintain complete order with no police. Now, God knew the Israelites would sin, and rather than them waiting to be judged and feeling bad about themselves, once a year they had the Day of Atonement, sacrificed, the blood was shed and sprinkled on the mercy seat, and everyone's sins in the nation were forgiven. They started the new year off with a clean slate. You know, the gospel, we talked about world history, we talked about American being unique, you get to be the king, but they looked to ancient Israel and the gospel. You know, have you ever sinned against anybody? You sort of don't want to be around the person you've sinned against. Let's so say you're talking about them behind their back, and you look up, and there they are. You want to go over to them? Or like, oh, man, I'm embarrassed to get away. And so when Adam and Eve sinned against God, they wanted to, God still wanted to walk with them in the garden. They wanted to get away. So it's like two magnets stuck together, and one of them turns. The first one wants to touch, but the second one wants to get away. So it's not so much that God sends people to hell. It's once people sin against God, it's their own conscience that makes them want to avoid him, stay away from him. And so when Adam and Eve sinned, they said, we blew it. We have to do something to make ourselves acceptable to God. They put on fig leaves. That was the beginning of false religions. Man coming up with man's idea how to make man acceptable to God. Did the fig leaves make Adam and Eve acceptable? No. And we read this little line, God made Adam and Eve coats of skins. Question, how do you make a coat of skin? Something has to die. You think God went to the other side of the garden, killed an animal, and brought Adam and Eve some nice tailored outfits? Or do you think maybe he killed the animal right in front of them? And they witnessed the first death ever, right? Creation just happened. This would have been the first thing ever to die. And Adam and Eve are watching this innocent animal go through the pangs of dying, and they're thinking, we're the ones that sin, but this innocent animal is the one that's dying. And God wanted to make it really clear the animal was dying in their place, that right in front of them, he strips the skin off the animal and puts it on their naked bodies. Maybe it still had a little blood on it, right? They were covered in the blood. And so for the rest of their lives, Adam and Eve are wearing the skin of the animal that they watched die in their place. And whenever God sees Adam and Eve, he sees them clothed with the skin of the animal, the lamb slain from the foundations of the world. Adam and Eve tell Cain and Abel, Cain wants to worship God, but he decides to do an offshoot of the 
church of the fig leaf. He starts the, the church of the fruits and the nuts. <laughs> Cain's is a religion of works. We know it's works because God told Adam, the ground is cursed for your sake. You'll bring forth fruit by the sweat of your brow. Cain's bringing forth fruit out of the ground. He's sweating. He's, work, he's trying to work his way to heaven. Did Cain's works make him acceptable to God? No. And then Abel did the lamb thing. And it's this picture. God is on one side. We are on the other side. Our sins separate us from God. And the lamb takes the judgment for all of our sins so we can be united with God. So when Noah got off the ark, he sacrificed lambs. Uh, Abraham sacrificed lambs. Moses said, every family in Israel, kill a lamb, put the blood over the doorpost of the house so the angel of death would pass over. The high priest brings the blood of the lamb into the holy holy, sprinkles it on the mercy seat. The blood changed it from a judgment seat into a mercy seat. And finally, John the Baptist points at Jesus and he says, behold, the lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. So God is on one side. We're on the other side. Our sin separates from God and the lamb pays for the sin. So I ask people, are you approaching God as Cain or as Abel? If you're still hoping you're good enough to go to heaven, you are approaching God as Cain. I hope I piled enough good works on the altar. Maybe a couple more handfuls of barley. That'll do it. Or are you approaching God as Abel? It's not me being good enough. It's this lamb that was good enough to take the judgment for all of my sins. And then why did the lamb have to die? God's just. He can't help it. He has to judge every sin because if he doesn't judge a sin, by his silence would be giving consent to the sin. Like in a wedding ceremony, if you're silent, you're giving consent. And if God gives consent to one sin one time, he denies himself. Right? And, um, and so God has to judge every sin. So God is just in that he judges every sin, but he's loving in that he provides the lamb to take the judgment for the sin. And so today, if you've not yet done so, put all your faith in the lamb. America, we have a country where there's freedom. There's freedom to preach the gospel. And there's freedom for you today to surrender your life to Jesus, who died on the cross to pay for all your sins. So you, the Lamb is God's way to love you without having to judge you. So God bless you.